Dirty Bird Podcast contains foul language and is not appropriate for young fledglings. Listener discretion is advised. Our intro music is brought to you by Ricky Pistone, aka Dick Piston. And our outro music is brought to you by the Sidewalk Slammers. Check them out wherever you get your music. Are you looking for a podcast today? With ornithology and humor you crave? Well, I know all these guys and it's birds they like. It's Dirty Bird. Yeah, they're just a couple guys who really like birds. It's Dirty Bird. Yeah, they're pretty dirty, but they really like birds. Hello, and welcome to Dirty Bird. I'm John, and I'm joined today by a very special guest, the Monongahela National Forest. Say hello, National Forest. I definitely like the Monongahela a lot. <laughs> and as I'm sitting here, a storm is kind of rolling in, but hopefully it doesn't hit me. If it does, I have a place set all ready to go. But right now I'm sitting out in the woods about a mile and a half from the road. It's a little weird recording by myself. The last one I did, I was sitting out by my feeder just kind of narrating everything. It's kind of weird doing an episode by myself, but we'll see how it goes, and you guys that listen can let me know if you like it, and maybe I'll do more in the future. It would uh, make it easier for me to put out more episodes on bird, but I love the Monongahela National Forest. It's very peaceful out here where I am. A lot of pissed off chipmunks, lots of birds. There's a nice stream in the background you can probably hear, and the rock formations are amazing. And we'll possibly, if it starts raining, go to my rain location, which is a cave opening very close to where I'm at. The reason why I'm recording in the Monongahela today is because it's a spot where I first and have only sighted the birds I'm going to be talking about today, the yellow and black-billed cuckoo. Now, these are some birds that if you're kind of a casual birder, backyard birder, got a feeder up or something, you probably don't really even know about or haven't seen. Most people with cuckoos, they think of the European cuckoo, which is the really common one. Cuckoos are kind of known for being parasites and laying their eggs in other birds' nests. And of course, the term cuck comes from cuckoo. So they're in our popular culture a lot and people know of them but not necessarily the yellow-billed and black-billed ones that are here in America and are really really cool and interesting birds once you get to know them. Man that thunder is ominous. But right now it's nice and dry. The forest is bright and happy. There's some sun breaking through the clouds and the birds are singing and bugs are flying all around and biting me and just living their life. I guess to start off with the cuckoos, I'll kind of start off describing them to you. The cuckoos, black-billed, and the yellow-billed are dove-sized birds that prefer deciduous forests. They kind of have slender bodies. Uh, The dove is very plump, pear-shaped. They're more slender. Um, When I first saw them, the very first time I saw a yellow-billed, I didn't even know what it was. I thought it was a weird-colored blue jay or something, so they kind of have a similar body to that, except they have a longer and downturned bill than the blue jay does. They're brown-gray on the top and then white on the bottom, and they're known their behavior in the trees is they're kind of slow and sluggish and they'll kind of hop from one tree branch to the other maybe very silently fly straight over to another tree they're usually pretty hidden not very conspicuous at all the black build is differentiated from the yellow build by 
its black bill, of course, but also it has a striking red eye. And uh, it kind of has more of a hunchback posture when it's perched than the yellow bill does. It's more the Quasimodo of the bird world. And both of them on their tails have these nice six white spots on there. The yellow bill has a little bit more brown and rufous colors on its feathers. And only the yellow part of its bill is yellow. The top part is kind of a black uh, brownish color. Now these birds are genus and species name. The black billed is called Coxisus erythropthalmus, which means red eye, uh, hearkening to that red eye, which is such a great field marker for it. And then the yellow billed, its genus and species name is Coxisus americanus, which just means of America. <laughs> but the genus that they're in, Coxisus, is contains about 16 birds, and it only contains cuckoos of the New World. Its name comes from the Greek kukuzu, which means to call like the common cuckoo. So this is another one of those names that doesn't, it's very, you know, descriptive. It doesn't have a great story behind it. And interestingly, most of these New World cuckoos don't really do brood paratism, which means going and laying their eggs in another bird's nest the way that the Europeans does. But they only just mostly do that. We're going to talk about how they do do that some. They flirt with it. They're in the family Cuculidae, which is a big family. It contains all the cuckoos. Um, also contains roadrunners, which are the close relatives to the cuckoos, and also birds such as coals and macoas. This family Cuculidae contains about 135 to 147 bird species. Now, the black-billed and yellow-billed cuckoos, as far as their diet goes, they are Lepidopterns, which is a great word, and that means that they like to eat butterflies, moths, and caterpillars. Flip. So I figured we'd start off talking about the bird that um, I first saw about a year ago when I was hiking out in this same trail out here, actually. I saw a yellow-billed cuckoo, and then actually my first black-billed was maybe... I don't know, two weeks ago when I was hiking out here. So I'm very happy to see them. And actually, since I started uh, sitting down and was record, you know, setting my levels and recording and everything, that fly just landed straight on the microphone. Um, <laughs> but when I was recording and setting my levels out here, I heard a cuckoo calling. Not sure whether it's yellow bit or black bit. I'm still not great on my calls yet. Um, I'm sure uh, we'll figure it out. But uh, that makes sense because there's a storm rolling in and kind of the folklore and a lot of people agree with this Audubon and the people that wrote my National Geographic book on birds agree that the cuckoos seem to call a little more when storms are coming in. So possibly as we're recording this, we'll get um, some cuckoo calls because uh, as I speak, the forest is getting darker and the thunder more ominous. But we'll start off talking about the yellow-billed cuckoo. Its range, it breeds uh, throughout the eastern United States and down into Mexico. It... <laughs> well, that was a loud one. I may be moving to my backup spot pretty soon here. But it breeds in the eastern, eastern U.S. down to Mexico, and it migrates down to eastern and northern South America. Uh, I saw reports that it goes as far down as northern Argentina, so it's a pretty far migrant. There's two distinct subspecies of the yellow-billed, the eastern and western. The western is more threatened than the eastern is. In 2014, it was declared threatened. And they're really hard to tell apart morphologically just looking at them. But you can do cytochrome and genetic analysis on them. And that seems to suggest that they diverged about 200 to 400,000 years ago. Um, as far as the feeding for the yellow-billed cuckoo, I mentioned that they're lepidopterans. And caterpillars really make up a huge part of their diet, uh, especially tent caterpillars. Both the black-billed and the yellow-billed cuckoo 
have the ability to shed their stomach lining. You've seen caterpillars with those spines on them. That's to deter animals from eating them because, you know, those spines, they'll get all lodged in your throat and stomach and everything. And they'll eat them and then they'll just shed their lining to get rid of the spines. So it doesn't bother them at all. They will forage in shrubs and trees. I saw that they'll like to kind of perch motionless and just look for movement and then kind of pounce on it like an ambush predator. They eat uh, insects mostly, but also will eat eggs, berries, and sometimes the yellow builds will also eat stuff like frogs or lizards. Yellow builds are especially known for liking cicadas. And cicadas, they have an annual cycle. There's a five to seven year cycle one. There's also a 13 and a 17 year cycle one. And then there's annual ones too. So on the years where cicadas have big eruptions, the cuckoos will just go crazy and gorge themselves and have really good reproductive years. There's a study done by the Wilson Bulletin in 1981 in Kansas during an emergency year of the 17 year cicada and it showed that there was an increased clutch size for the yellow-billed cuckoo that year. And the reason why cicadas will do these cycles like this in kind of weird, odd years, 13 or 17 or 5 to 7, I guess those are prime numbers too, is so that animals don't seek up, sync up their reproductive cycles to when the cicadas emerge. Because basically the strategy of the cicadas is to overwhelm the environment and the animals around that there'll just be so many of them that the other animals can't eat them and there'll be enough cicadas to breed and propagate for the next cycle. And interestingly, in West Virginia, this summer, the 17-year cicadas for this area are supposed to emerge. The bigger one for the eastern coast is supposed to be next summer. However, they haven't emerged yet. I heard that they don't emerge until the soil temperature, like six inches down, reaches 65 degrees. And we've still been having some nights that sink down into the upper 50s, even in June. So we'll see. Hopefully they emerge pretty soon here. As far as how the yellow-billed population is holding up, it seems to have declined by about 52% between 1966 and 2015. The population right now is estimated about 9 million, with 10% of those in Mexico. The western subspecies is especially declining due to loss of riparian habitat, uh, habitat along streams. And there may be just as few as 40 breeding pairs left in California. I hope this thunder isn't ruining the podcast. I think it does sound kind of cool, but hopefully you can still hear me over it. It's weird because the sun is still kind of shining and the forest is still bright and nice. I mean, birds are still flying around and everything, but man, that thunder comes and everything shuts up. <laughs> including me. The reproduction of cuckoos is pretty cool. This is kind of the big thing of the podcast because, you know, we know about the classic... Oh, hold on, there's an ant on the microphone. Those flies are loud, but I guess an ant walking doesn't make a sound. But uh, the, the reproduction of the cuckoos is kind of the big thing of the po- question of the podcast because these European ones are almost entirely obligate parasites. They only lay their eggs in other birds' nests, similar to what uh, the cowbird is out here. Uh, It's a little more complicated with our New World cuckoos. Some of them don't do it at all, and some of them, like the black-billed and yellow-billed, will do it here and there, but still also lay their own litters. They don't have any kind of like specific date or time that they uh, start building their nests and lay their eggs, but they seem to try to coincide their breeding with eruptions of insect populations. If there's a big eruption of cicadas or big eruption of tent caterpillars, they'll try to time their breeding with that. They usually will arrive from South America in June and then leave around September. So that's kind of their window of breeding season when they're here in the U.S. The courtship of them is pretty interesting with the yellow builds. The male may feed or offer sticks nesting materials to a potential mate. I saw one account where a male offered a stick and the female appeared receptive and then the male mounted her and they both um, clutched the stick together while they mated. So I guess sticks are sex toys for cuckoos? I don't know. Um, Pairs may visit potential nesting sites together. I talked about this in our last episode with cardinals. Cardinals will do that, kind of like they're house hunting. We'll go look at potential sites. 
they also build a nest together. Uh, the black bill does this too. They nest in low trees or shrubs about four to ten feet off the ground. John James Audubon describes it as they nest within the reach of man who seldom disturbs it. Of course, unless you're John James Audubon, he will disturb it because he writes about where him and his compatriots found a nest and they climbed up to, to get to it and two of the birds were big enough to get out of the nest and they climbed among the tree twigs and then the other ones were too small on the nest. And the cuckoos will not lay all their eggs at the same time. They'll kind of space out the timing of laying their eggs so that they'll hatch and develop at different times. So when John James Audubon went to this nest, one of them was almost fully developed. Another one was pretty close. There was two that were like little and tiny. And then there was actually even a couple eggs in there that hadn't even hatched yet. And one that looked like he said it had been laid just yesterday. So they really space these things out. And in his account... Uh, the two that tried to run away, they're like clutched onto the tree branches and John James Audubon and his friends are shaking the tree trying to knock him out. But he says that they clutched so tightly that they had to be extracted by hand. So he's the one who, uh, who will disturb them. But usually they lay about three light blue eggs and the male and female will take turns incubating them. It takes nine to 11 days for the eggs to hatch. And like I said, they stagger them being born. The young have these like bursting feather sheaths and they are described as looking like porcupines when they hatch. And the cuckoos kind of have a strategy for their young where they grow very quickly and leave the nest very quickly once they hatch. This may be related to parasitism because if you lay an egg in another bird's nest, you want once it hatches, you want it to grow quickly so it can outcompete the other birds that uh, are in the, the other little young birds that are in the nest and get and be big enough to where it can outcompete for food and maybe even push them out of the nest. So that's likely where this kind of evolved from. But they will be burn, born with these little feather porcupine spiky sheaths and then they'll burst and they'll become fully feathered within two hours of hatching. Both parents feed the young via regurgitation, and only after seven to nine days, the chicks will leave the nest. However, they can't fly until they're 21 days old. So they'll really be walking amongst the treetops, maybe hopping from tree to tree. John James Audubon, when he described those two yellow-billed younglings clutching to the tree branch like that, they probably are, that's, they're pretty, have pretty strong feet since they can't fly yet. That's, that's their only way of, of getting around. The father will take care of some of the first to leave the nest while the mother will stay and take care of the rest that are still staggered in their hatching and growing process. This is also similar to the cardinal too where the male will take care of them when they leave the nest and then the mother will kind of focus on taking care of the nest, raising whoever's left or maybe even starting another brood. They are found to sometimes engage in polyandry behaviors. Um, and also cooperative breeding too, where say you had some young last year, they may not be totally ready to mate and have their own young yet. And so they might help their parents with raising another batch. Uh, and then polyandry means the male might mate with some other females and, and father some multiple broods. Now I'll go ahead and describe the black build and talk about it a little bit. And then we'll go into the brood parasitism in these uh, yellow builds and black builds. How much they do it? Do they do it at all? Find out. Keep listening to find out. So the black billed cuckoo, they have a range uh, bigger than the yellow billed cuckoo. They'll range from South Canada down to upper parts of North Carolina, Tennessee. The oh god, stupid fly, go away from my microphone. So the black billed cuckoo has a further north range than the yellow billed. The yellow billed can be found uh, throughout a lot of the south, uh, but not too far up into the north. Uh, the black builds will migrate at night in mixed flocks via a southwestern migratory route, and that's because they winter in Colombia, Ecuador, and Venezuela. And while they're doing this migration, since it's southwest, they'll sometimes be a vagrant onto the west coast. Oh, we lucked out. There's a cuckoo right there. Does that mean it's about to rain? I hope not, but that's cool to hear right when you're talking about it. Oh, 
Yep. It was calling the rain. Here's the rain. All right. Dirty Bird will be back. <laughs> back the acoustics are probably much different i am now recording from a cave so that i can avoid the rain that's outside and uh i will say if you go and do your research the all the caves in the monongahela forest there are many are currently closed right now because of white nose syndrome it is a fungus that has decimated bat populations in america it was brought over from europe uh, I'm only just in the very small entrance of this cave. Uh, there haven't been bats spotted within the particular cave that I am in. But um, yeah, I just needed to get my recording equipment out of the rain there. So hopefully the change in the audio quality doesn't throw you off too much. I probably am reverberating a lot. There are some cave crickets hanging out with me right now. Some really weird black hairy spiders that I'm not totally sure have eyeballs. Um, some old salamanders that I've seen darting in and out of the moist rocks and stuff. It's a little bit creepy, I'm not going to lie, and I'm using my flashlight to kind of read my notes here. It's not to I'm just in the entrance, so it's not totally dark, but you know, it gets, it gets dark quick in here. and Yeah, it's a little bit creepy. Hopefully no cave monsters hear me and come up and and grab my recording equipment. Um, so, back to the black-billed cuckoo. Its bill is as black as this cave. Oh, God, I do the worst jokes, especially when I'm recording by myself. <laughs> so the black-billed cuckoo, we talked about its migration. We talked about how it's found a little further north, and then it'll fly southwest down to uh, South America and spend a nice winter there. Um, as far as the black-billed cuckoo's feeding, it's really similar to the yellow-billed. They love to eat them caterpillars. They also seem to eat uh, water snails and small crustaceans that they find in the water a little more than the yellow-billed does. John James Audubon states that he seems to see them near waters and streams more often than he, the yellow-billed, and I can concur this. I mean, I've only seen the yellow-billed and black-billed once, and then heard them today when I was recording with you guys, but I noticed that the black bill, when I saw it, it was right next to a stream versus the yellow bill. I kind of saw it up in the woods some, not really too close to a stream. I will note, uh, talking about how much they love caterpillars, uh, one black bill that was dissected was found to have about a hundred caterpillars in its stomach. They've been observed trying to beat caterpillars against trees to try to knock the spines off of them. I also talked about how both the yellow and black billed will shed their stomach linings to get rid of spines. Also, they can regurgitate the spines as a pellet, kind of like an owl pellet, except a little, instead of mouse bones in it, there's little caterpillar spines. Black billed seemed really tied to caterpillar eruptions and will time their nestings to coincide with the eruptions of the caterpillars or cicadas. Their population, like the yellow billed, is declining. It's thought that pesticides may contribute a lot to this. You know, as the pesticides kill the very bugs that these guys feed on, then they can't really, then they don't have anything to eat, pretty much. Um, there's tales of, back from, you know, the 1800s and everything, of hundreds of black bill cuckoos descending on trees and picking them clean of every single caterpillar. But their population has declined about 68% from 1970. And... Black builds are less numerous than the yellow build was. I said the yellow build's population was around 9 million. The black build is only 890,000. And so I felt really fortunate when I saw that one in West Virginia. Uh, it was a really cool experience to watch him. That red eye is really striking. I mean, you can't miss it. And then just the way they move, they're kind of hunched. They're just like Quasimodo up in the tree there, hopping from branch to branch. And they fly so quiet, too. Most birds, you kind of hear them flap and they'll give a call when they fly away uh, when they're kind of scared this guy he just saw me kind of looked at me didn't like what i was about and just silently flew to another tree 
black bill cuckoos are expected to decrease another 50% by uh, 2055, unfortunately. And that just has to do with the insect populations, how much pesticides are out there, and then also global climate change, too. So as far as the reproduction of the black bills goes, they reproduce around mid-late May. And the mating with them is kind of similar to the yellow bill. We talked about how the yellow bills like to use a stick in a bedroom. But uh, the male will usually land on the branch near the female, and it will hold an insect in its mouth, give a nice little cuckoo call. And if the female is interested, she'll pump her tail and give a nice little mew. And then the male will mate with her with the insect still in his mouth, and he may even feed it to her. So a little bit of George Costanza getting channeled with these black builds here. So while uh, the yellow builds are into, you know, sex toys with sticks, the black builds, they're into food stuff. Uh, black builds seem to be pretty monogamous, a little bit more than the yellow builds are. That might have to do with their lower population. The yellow builds, there's 9 million of them. They can find another little one on the side, but... Uh, these black belts, they, they, you know, have to stick with their mate. They nest in low shrubs and trees, just like the yellow builds did. And both parents will help make the nest. They weave a little platform of twigs, line it with dead leaf scrap, uh, grass, leaves, pine needles. They usually also lay about three blue-green eggs. And both parents will incubate for about 10 to 14 days. Um, I read a nice little thing, Nesting Habits of the black billed Cuckoo by O. Ruth Spences, and uh, they talked about how a chick emerged completely dry from the egg, which is kind of weird because you think of an egg as a you know kind of wet place like this cave, but they emerged completely dry. Nestlings would have coal black skin with wiry gray hairs. Uh, the juvenile counter tubes would quickly grow. Like I said, they look like porcupines, um, and Unlike the yellow build, where they would kind of immediately feather pop, the black builds, it takes them until about day six until their feathers will kind of pop out. And then their eyes, uh, well, their eyes open at day two. And then that, uh, that quill popping occurs around day six to seven. Both parents will feed and care for the young. Uh, they'll either feed them live or freshly crushed caterpillars versus the yellow build would regurgitate the caterpillars. These nestlings are described as having weird warts in their mouth. Originally, people, when they would look at the nestlings, they would think that they had like some kind of infection or something, but they just kind of have these warts for some reason. The parents will brew the young if they're cold. They'll shade them if they're hot. And I saw reports that they'll even cover them in a rainstorm. So they're, pr they're pretty nice to their kids. The parents will also defend the nest. They'll swoop at intruders. And the young do a characteristic pointing of their beaks towards the sky whenever anyone gets close to the nest. I don't know why that is. So the parents will swoop and the young will like point straight up towards the sky. I, I have no idea what kind of purpose that serves. The younglings here will leave the nest around six to seven days, uh, but they also can't fly for several days later, uh, sometimes as long as 17 days. So they'll just hop among the branches. That is a really cool thing about these guys is that they leave the nest so freaking early and then even though they can't fly, they'll just kind of hang out in the trees and stay safe up there. And I think that this evolves from brood parasitism because they're known to engage both the black build and the yellow build in brood parasitism, but they don't do it exclusively like the European cuckoo does. And they seem to parasitize off of each other more than other bird species. So like either a black build will lay in a yellow build or another black build to nest or a yellow build will lay in a black build or another yellow build. So like usually they'll just be laying in other cuckoos nest for the brood parasitism. However, they, they will lay in, in other bird species, chipping sparrows, robins, blue gray cat birds, wood thrushes, and also warblers. And this is interesting because the warblers, um, the cuckoo eggs are like four times the size of the warbler eggs, but the warblers don't even really seem to notice that much. Um, a guy, William Brewster, in 1884, he reported that as many as 10% of cuckoo nests he found contained eggs of other species. Chickadees, titmice, and thrushes will mob cuckoos if they approach their nest. So the other birds are aware that, like, the cuckoos are, are you know, bad and everything and, and can prey on them. But the cuckoos don't really do it exclusively. They're probably kind of more opportunistic with it. And actually, my working theory with it is we talked about how the 
they will time their egg laying with eruptions of bugs and stuff like that. So my kind of theory with it is if like the bug populations aren't super good and they're like worried about, oh, can I support all this? You know, I already laid like three. Like, am I going to be able to support this other one I lay? Then they'll go find another nest to lay it in and be like, hey, here, you take them. You deal with that. The black build has a great variety of vocalizations and so does the yellow build too. The black build uh, makes like a nice croak call, a coo-oo-oo call, and like I said, these calls are thought to uh, predict rain coming, and I don't know, we might have just proved it in a little anecdotal experiment there, because right when that cuckoo started calling, it started raining and drove me into the cave. I realize I forgot to talk about the vocalizations of the yellow-billed cuckoo. Audubon describes him as doing a cow-cow-cow call. Um, and this is why they're sometimes called the cowbird in the U.S., not to mix them up with the brown-headed cowbird or the bronze cowbird, which are also <laughs> parasitic nesters. Um, he talks about how it seems to like call it on cloudy days, which has earned it the nickname Rain Crow in certain areas. Audubon also points to the Dutch Pennsylvania farmers who specifically call it the Rain Crow. He also points out that the Creoles of Louisiana call it Cuckoo. Um, and they are the only ones that are kind of known to eat the yellow-billed cuckoo in the country. I guess Audubon didn't eat it. He ate a lot of birds, but he doesn't talk about the taste of it or anything. He just mentions the Creoles like to eat it. So <laughs> I guess he didn't try it. Um, predators of the black-billed and yellow-billed. Uh, hawks and falcons like to eat them. The nestlings are taken by common nest predators like grackles, crows, snakes, raccoons. And they're especially prone, the um, adults, to predation right after they come back from migration and they're really tired. The oldest known cuckoo was known to be about four to five years old. I want to talk a little bit about gypsy moths and cuckoos. Cuckoos are one of our great battlers of gypsy moths. Gypsy moths are a moth that's native to Europe, Asia, and North Africa, but they were brought to the U.S. by a French scientist named Leopold Trevelot in 1860. And he brought over gypsy moths because he was trying to breed a better silk spinning caterpillar. Uh, the gypsy moth will eat almost anything, whereas traditional silk spinning caterpillars are really picky in what they eat. Um, however, a small number of them escaped from his home in Bedford, Massachusetts. And like <laughs> within a few years, um, people were reporting that they were everywhere. Uh, within 10 years, the trees in Bedford were massively defoliated. And then the gypsy moths just continued to spread. And now they extend into Virginia, North Carolina, all the way over to Michigan. And there's some pockets on the Pacific coast, too. They can cause massive deforestations that'll kill trees. Sometimes um, if gypsy moths are observed just eating a bunch of trees, like foresters will just log all the trees or intentionally start fires to try to control the spread of uh, the gypsy moss, so they can be really, really destructive to our forests. However, I did see some reports that gypsy moss, if they're not a severe infestation, they can actually kind of help forests by thinning them out and fertilizing the soil with their foss. That's a great new word, foss, F-A-A-S-S. F -A -S -S. That's the droppings from moss when they eat leaves. And like it's akin to, you know, the leaves fall off the trees and eventually turn into soil. This is almost like automatic soil, basically, the moth poop. Cuckoos might be really important to controlling outbreaks of gypsy moss. In 2006, it was a dry year of this fungus called Entomophagia mamega which is a fungus that was actually introduced in 1910 to try to control gypsy moss. Um, however, uh, in dry years, this fungus won't do well. The gypsy moth population will control, and the cuckoos, people will observe more cuckoos as they eat more of the gypsy moss, and they may be really important in controlling these. So, way to go, cuckoos. 
So I wanted to read a little bit too from my handy dandy, my handy dandy book, The Book of Birds by the National Geographic Society. So here they do um, some pretty good descriptions of the black billed and yellow billed. The black billed, the author talks about how on a warm September day he was in the Blue Ridge Mountains on White Top Mountain when he saw a uh, black billed cuckoo flying from tree to tree. He notes the slender form of this bird and how well it conceals itself. The description of the yellow billed cuckoo is great too. <laughs> he describes a series of grating notes half harsh and half resonant, followed one another in definite arrangement. That is the yellow-billed cuckoo. Watch closely among the leaves, and presently you may see a slender bird with a long, white-spotted tail, and as it turns its head, a distinct flash of orange, yellow, from the lower half of its bill. Any farmer will tell you the voice of this rain crow prophesies a downpour. I'll finish up my podcast in the cave here. And we'll finish up talking about the evolution and then also some myths and legends about the cuckoos. The evolution of the cuckoos is very tangled. Sorry, I keep turning to like look in the cave because the black behind me is like kind of creeping me out. I keep expecting some kind of troglodyte to come out and grab me. Um, <laughs> the evolution of these birds is uh, pretty tangled and crazy. They're very old um, species that their ancestral stock evolved uh, back in the Cretaceous. So it's very hard to suss out the exact evolution of these guys. They're highly diverse and widespread, so they have a really long evolutionary history. My one, one zoom tree of life has the branch that resulted in rails, cranes, bustards, and cuckoos diverging off from other avian species around 71.5 million years ago, and that uh, would be in the late Cretaceous. Um, during this time, Pangaea had broken up into Laurasia and Gondwana. Laurasia, that's like Europe, Asia, Gondwana, that's Africa, uh, South America, North America. And then Gondwana further broke up into its respective continents. Uh, the terrestrial roadrunner. I mentioned how the roadrunner is in the family Cucullidae with these guys. So the roadrunner is thought to be more ancient because it's more widespread than the cuckoo is. It occurs in South America, North America, Africa, Madagascar, hanging out with the lemurs, South Asia. Um, arboreal cuckoos, the cuckoos that fly around in trees. Um, they're widespread too, but um, they're mostly heavily concentrated in the tropics. So usually when a bird is like more concentrated in one area, we think, okay, it probably started here, diverged, and then spread out. Um, there's a lot of argument for a Gondwana origin for the cuckoo birds. It seems that the immediate ancestors to our New World cuckoos inhabited West Gondwana, and when Gondwana split, they separated. Uh, there were uh, cuckoo species that went off into Africa, and then our New World cuckoos that uh, were in South America. But there's still a lot of questions with these guys. Did they, did they evolve in South America and then fly over to Africa when like the continents were still close together? Did they totally kind of uh, evolve on opposite sides of Gondwana? Um, and then as far as the relation to North America too, did they evolve in North America also? Or did they evolve in South America and then all cross over to North America? And then there's a huge question, too, about whether the arboreal species evolved in Gondwana before the breakup, or whether it was just all roadrunners, and then it broke up, and then the cuckoos evolved. So it's a lot of questions. We're not going to be able to answer them here, but we will kind of give you a little bit of insight about what the most likely scenarios are and what scientists are thinking. Uh, there is an arboreal cuckoo fossil that we have from the late Eocene. This is about 35 million years ago, and it was found in Colorado. It's called Eococulus cherpine, um, and it's very similar to the old world cuckoos, the common cuckoo, as far as its fossil goes. And just to give kind of some context, 35 million years ago, this is around the time when an asteroid hit America and created the Chesapeake Bay. So there was a lot of crazy changes going on at this time. The oldest fossil that's closest to our yellow-billed and black-billed cuckoos is from the Oligocene. It's about 23 million years old. It's called Neococcyx macoquildalliae. 
Um, and it was found in Saskatchewan in Canada. Now, like I said, cuckoos evolve from roadrunners, and roadrunners have kind of X-shaped feet. They're zygodactylic, and uh, our cuckoos are also. They don't have three toes pointing forward and one back like a lot of our songbirds. They have uh, kind of two forward and two back. This kind of shows that they separated as a distinct order before the passerines evolved, before our songbirds with their three toes forward evolved. And they actually split off even before the common ancestor that formed falcons and woodpeckers split off. So that's kind of how old that cuckoo uh, order is, is they split off real early. And as far as the evolution of parasitism in the cuckoos, it's not very common in the bird world. Not many birds do it. We got the cowbird over here. There's the cuckoos in the old world. There's a few scattered species here and there. Most birds, you know, raise their own young. And so the fact that parasitism exists in some way or form in a lot of these species makes us think that evolved once in a common ancestor that all of the cuckoo species later evolved from. And so some of them have kind of held on to that behavior. And whereas some like the European cuckoo are totally just all about that parasitism, our yellow builds, black builds, it's kind of just in the back of their evolutionary mind and they kind of do it here and there as they need to. And the way that the uh, yellow belts and black belts, the reason why I think that they're young will leave the nest so quickly like that, even before they can fly, is probably because they it's a remnant of that uh, obligate parasitism where they need to grow real quick to outcompete the other nestlings in, in there of the other birds. And even if they can't fly yet, they'll get real big. They'll get all the food from their host mom and dad and uh and succeed so as far as our um our genus coccyzius it's related most closely to the piaya genus uh, this genus contains the squirrel cuckoo and the black-bellied cuckoo which are both in south america and the other genus that's close to these guys is clamator and this is contains all old world species and so Kind of the big split between New World and Old World cuckoos comes with that clamator. The clamator um, split off and these coccyzius and piaya, they stayed in the New World. So that was probably happening around the time that Gondwana was splitting up. Tree of Life actually has clamator splitting off around 34 million years ago. Um, that kind of coincides with our fossil from Colorado. Remember, it looked a lot like the old world cuckoos. So this is just when these guys were uh, differentiating. So probably all the birds within, all the cuckoos in the Americas, in, in Europe, Africa, all were pretty similar. But then as the continent split, the new world cuckoos kind of diverged and became more distinct and different. Piaia and Coccyzius split off around 30 to 20 million years ago. And the Coccyzius genus is uh, pretty diversified. I said there's about 16 species in it. The black build looks like it kind of split off first around 15.2 million years ago, whereas our yellow build is a little bit more recent, around 2.8 million years ago is when it really differentiated. And uh, because of this big, I mean, that's like 13 million years separating these guys, because of that, and because they're really closely related to these South American uh, genuses, the Piaia, um, it's thought that, that they started in South America and then colonized North America, flying over kind of in, um, island hopping on the early forming Panama Bridge. But it doesn't look like one ancestor crossed from South America and then went to North America and then became yellow billed and then also became black billed. It looks like two different common ancestors came over. A black billed common ancestor, a yellow billed common ancestor came over. And so they colonized North America separately. Interestingly, this stuff isn't just in the past. It's kind of happening today, too. There's an article in Birdwatching Daily from 2018 that shows that common cuckoos and oriental cuckoos have been crossing the Bering Strait into Alaska. And conversely, uh, brown-headed cowbirds are going the opposite way. So if you're bringing your common cuckoo brood parasites to America, then we're sending our brown-headed cowbirds, which are <laughs> parasites, over to you. 
Now, it kind of sounds like it stopped raining out there, so I think I might venture out of this cave to bring us our last part on cuckoos, myths, legends, and folklore. And uh, I'll touch on some cool stuff there. And we're back, back above ground. I will say after being in that cave, it is hot, humid, and bright out here. But I definitely appreciate it. It is beautiful. I don't hear any more thunder. The clouds seem to be clearing up. The cuckoo's not calling anymore. So hopefully there's not going to be any more rain. There was a beautiful wood thrush singing just a moment ago. Maybe he'll start again and we can pick that up on the recording. But let's wrap this show up with some myths and legends. So the name cuckoo comes from their call, but also you'll know cuckoo as a sign for crazy. As a kid, you know, spinning your finger around your head going cuckoo, cuckoo to make fun of someone. And that seems to be uh, derived from the cuckold connotations of cuckoo, that you would be uh, stupid, lazy, or crazy um, if you are a cuckold. And the way that the term cuck comes from cuckoo is the brood parasitism that the European cuckoo does. Uh, it's kind of obvious that it goes and it lays its eggs in another bird's nest. So then a man or woman that you know cheats on their significant other is uh, the one being cheated on is is then the cuck. Um, it goes way back to medieval times. The earliest. Uh, I could find of it being used is from the Owl and the Nightingale from the 1200s uh, where the term cuck first appeared. Shakespeare really liked to use the term cuck um, in plays such as Othello it comes up a lot and is a major theme driving the characters. You also hear about wearing the horns of a cuckold uh, that refers the horns are not actually a lot of people think it's like the spurs on chickens that uh, roosters will kind of fight with and stuff. But actually it seems to come from the antlers of deers as they'll battle for a mate and then the winner will get the mate. So if you're wearing the horns, then you're like the losing deer. In Italy, actually making the sign of horns, kind of like the, the rock on sign that we know in America, uh, if you do those horns, you're basically calling the other person a cuck, and uh, them's fighting words. Cuckoo is also where the term kook comes when you're surfing, uh, and you're like a newbie or a terrible surfer, you'll get called a kook, and that's never a good day on the waves. Um, and it's also where the term kooky comes from. And I didn't know that, but it seems pretty obvious. Also, the term of cuckoo and as being like crazy could come from the fact that sometimes cuckoos will just repeat themselves over and over again with their calls and kind of seem crazy. But I mean, a lot of birds do that. Like robins will sit up there and sing all day. So uh, I don't really buy that one as much. There's a very tangled relationship with the word gawk and cuckoos. You know, gawk, like you stare at something kind of with your mouth open and... Uh, but it seems to be related to the word cuckoo. It's not exactly sure straightforward how, or at least I couldn't figure it out. I was reading these etymology articles that are going into like the Old Norse and the High German and the Proto-German. Um, I don't even know there was a difference. But anyway, there's an Old Norse world gok for cuckoo. And there's also similar derivatives for the High German, Proto-German. And in Middle English, uh, there's a word goin, uh, which means to stare, um, and then a Proto-German word that refers to your gawk hand, or your clumsy left hand. In Scotland, they also refer, um, I'm not sure if they still refer to it today, or if it's like with one of the um, Scots languages, to a gawk storm, which is a... Um, a storm in the spring uh, and before it comes the cuckoos are calling a lot. So I guess even the cuckoos, not just the cuckoos here, are rain crows um, call the rain. I guess cuckoos over in Europe do it also. So there's an Iroquois story about our black and yellow billed cuckoos. And this comes from a book by Mabel Powers in 1917 called Stories the Iroquois Tell Their Children. Now, I'm not sure how like true this book is or if it's just kind of 
culturally appropriated to sell books, um, tales. But I like to think that there's, even if facts are kind of made up to suit a Western audience, that there's kind of a kernel of truth that this existed as an Iroquois tale. But it's called Why the Cuckoo is So Lazy. And it said that the old man of the North Lodge had breathed upon the valley. Crops were frozen and there was no game. Everyone in the village was working hard to hunt and bring in food to their families, except one man who just waited for everyone else to bring in the food and game. So his family just got scraps from everyone else, and they were all hungry. And his son was continually pleading with the father to go out and hunt, to go bring back some food. The father became angry with him and hit him with a wooden spoon. The moment the spoon hit the little kid's forehead, the sun disappeared and turned into a bird that perched on a kettle and solemnly said, Now it's done. That spring, the other Native Americans in the village noticed that the man was no longer lazy, and he was moving about the village and hunting game and doing all kinds of stuff. But there was a new bird in the forest, and they noticed that this bird was lazy and would just lay eggs anywhere, barely haphazardly build a nest, and wouldn't work for himself to bring in food. And that's the story. So I guess what happened is that the father, when he hit the son, the son turned into a bird that then acted like the father did. And the father was like so distraught at this that he changed his ways. Or maybe he transferred his laziness to the son who turned into the bird. I'm not really sure or if there's a moral to this or anything, or but I guess uh, it kind of describes uh, why the cuckoo is so lazy. Also, another note I have on cuckoos here is a big thing when I thought about cuckoo meaning crazy is all I could think of is, I'm cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. I'm cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Um, and I did some research about how that like mascot was developed and everything. It's just kind of a generic brown bird that was developed. It wasn't like based off of looking like a cuckoo or anything. It brown because, you know, the Cocoa Puffs are brown. Um, but I did see that he uh, originally had a name, Sonny. And that's because in like the original commercial, it was him and his father or grandpa bird. And the grandpa bird is like disapproving of him eating the cereal or something so he was named Sonny and uh, then there was the the dad or grandpa also with him so there you go now now you know the name of the cuckoo for cocoa puffs bird cuckoos appear in mythology of a wide array of cultures not our black build and yellow build um, I'm sure there were some Native American legends about them but I couldn't find a ton of them uh, but since they're such a widespread bird, lots of other cultures have um, stories about them too. In Hindu mythology, the cuckoo is the wife of the demigod Kama. Um, Kama is sometimes called the Hindu Cupid. In uh, classical Greek mythology, Zeus had six lovers, um, including one of his sisters, Demeter, um, which produced a lot of the other gods in Greek mythology. However, he found Hera, and which was another one of his sisters and wanted her however she kept rejecting him she's like eh, i'm breaking the greek stereotype i'm not sleeping with my brother but then zeus disguised himself as a rain-soaked cuckoo and hera felt pity on him and put him under her bosom when he then transformed back into zeus and then you know did what zeus usually does there's a cuckoo day on April 28th, which is celebrated in Cornwall in Western England. And there's many cuckoo superstitions throughout Europe. I saw in Germany hearing a cuckoo during a meal means you're going to have a hungry year to come. And then I also saw in Denmark on hearing the first cuckoo of spring, if you ask, when will I marry? Each call the cuckoo makes back is one year until you get married. And here comes the rain again, although I did not hear the cuckoo. A little disappointed. So I'll put away the recording equipment before things get too wet. Lots of wind. Damn it. Thank you guys for joining me here on Dirty Bird. Let me know what you thought about me recording by myself here. Write in, send me an email at dirtybirdpodcast at gmail.com. Follow us on Instagram at dirtybirdpodcast. Let me know what birds you want to hear about, what kind of topics you want me to cover. Thanks, and until next time, stay dirty, my birdies.
the Dirty Bird Podcast is recorded by me, John Chanusik, with our rotating panel of guests and co-hosts. Thanks, you guys, for being on the show. Our theme song is composed by Ricky Pistone, a.k.a. Dick Piston, and our outro music is by the Sidewalk Slammers. Check them out wherever you get your music. Our logo was designed by my beautiful fiance, Lauren McClure. Special thanks to the talented Jessica for contributing her avian artwork and photos. Follow Dirty Bird Podcast on Instagram and Facebook and send us listener mail. I'd love to hear from you about what you think of the show, what birds you've seen recently, or any questions you have. Email us at dirtybirdpodcast at gmail.com. If you can, subscribe to the show on iTunes or Spotify and leave a review. Thanks for listening. at the track drive into Brooklyn ain't never coming back Tim's on the ground in the concrete jungle I might get into a little rumble ain't nothing but a hot tail man bread on the farm so I work with my hands just call me a New York redneck where's the banjo play that bill of Fucking ass.